pastors and friends, I'd like to extend to you a welcome to uh, our service this afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> President Ross is presiding this morning, this afternoon. There's one announcement that uh, we'd like to uh, make. Uh, and this is from the uh, presiding bishop, Rick, uh, Welfare Services. It says that uh, the Relief Society is coordinating an effort to provide needed quilts for most of our refugees who are returning home and facing winter months ahead. Individual members of families and Relief Societies are invited to make and donate crib size, single size, and double size quilts to the Latter-day Saints Humanitarian Center, and this was posted out on our bulletin board. This donation is to be voluntary and without assignment uh, from church leaders. There's no, no funding is to be provided from local uh, unit funds. And again, there's a copy of this posted out on the bulletin board. Uh, we will begin by uh, singing uh, our opening hymn, which is 249, uh, after which uh, Brother Frank Howell will offer the invocation.
be able to, to be led by the Spirit and to work hard, Father. We ask thee to please bless each of us as we travel today. We'll be able to do so in safety, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Did anyone miss the sacrament? We want to thank the Iranian priesthood for attending this sacrament. We'll now proceed with the uh, program as an outline with one change. Following uh, Brother Michael Packer's uh, concluding talk, we will uh, sing I Believe in Christ hymn number 134 and following that the benediction will be offered by Brother Wade Hayes. Brothers and sisters, I am honored for this chance to speak at, at, at this, uh, this sacrament meeting, uh, for the chance to reflect a little bit on my mission and think about Michael and his mission. He is about to spend about the next 730 days, more or less, talking about uh, something that we're going to talk about in a minute. And about 700 of it will be in Peru. And on his mission, he will do things that are very similar to what Prophet of old has talked about and done. And if you think back, clear back to the time of Adam, there has been one message that has been taught and taught and talked about and celebrated and talked about some more and symbolized in all of the, all of the ordinances and rituals and, and things that we do. It's symbolized in our sacrament, it's symbolized in our baptism, it's symbolized in every religious act that we do. And it's, he, Michael's going to be able to talk about this thousands of times. He's going to be able to read about it thousands of times, every day. And he's out there for almost a thousand days anyway. This is about the atonement, the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is almost the only thing he's going to be talking about for the next two years. Very little else. Yeah, maybe a little bit about keeping the commandments. Maybe a little bit about the restoration. But those things pale in comparison to talking about the very core of our gospel. And since the very time of Adam, when they, when, uh, as soon as the fall of Adam took place, he was, Adam was instructed on the redemption, the great plan of redemption, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And from that time forth, repentance was cried, and repentance, we know that repentance is made possible only because of the atonement. In fact, today, um, in our sacrament here, uh, the third verse in particular, it says, uh, there was no other good enough to pay the price for sin. Only he, referring to Jesus Christ, could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. Michael is going to teach that Jesus Christ is the only person by whom, uh, who, who could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. The only person who could atone for our sins, who pay the penalty for our sins, and make it possible for us to be twins and live again with Heavenly Father. He's going to cry repentance every day. He's going to um, he's going to teach faith in Christ, repentance, and the atonement. I remember when I was on my mission, we didn't in in uh, Spain and Europe, they had a little different atmosphere, I think, than what they have in South America. But I still was able to teach quite a few people uh, at least one time, whether they wanted to hear it or not. But the one thing I taught them was Jesus Christ. I didn't get too much into the commandments. That was pretty rare. About the word of wisdom, about keeping the Sabbath day holy. That was only if they were just about to get baptized, which was pretty rare. But the atonement of Jesus Christ, the, re, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I was able to teach that almost every day. And 
that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Because other than teaching the gospel, Michael is going to have an awful lot of time to think. And missionaries don't get to think about a whole lot of things. They don't get to think about women. They don't get to think about jobs. They don't get to think about uh, cars, trucks, the careers. All they think about is about, now I'm not going to say 100%, but 98%, is the gospel. And it all centered right down to the core again. And so I'm very excited for Michael because he's going to be able to think about the atonement and he's going to think of new ways to teach it because if you teach it something a thousand and thousands of times, you've got to, you got to pay if you don't find more than one way to explain it. But he is, he's going to be able to, he's going to live the gospel, he's going to live, eat, sleep, and drink atonement for the next almost thousand days. I'm very excited for this. I know what it will do to him as a person. It will make him very similar to what his namesake is. Uh, he'll be a leader, a champion. He's brilliant. And he will be able to... Uh, he'll be able to fulfill his measure of creation and, and just be the, the wonderful man that he is. I'm very excited about this. And I share this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On our way down here from North Texas yesterday, we stopped at a McDonald's and I saw something that amused me. A disgruntled employee angrily cackled at his co-worker, you stole my plastic lid covers because you had run out. It's the very things, you know, that are supposed to better serve the customers with. And I felt, I felt like grabbing my neck and saying, you, you still ain't those aren't yours. You probably don't know you not own, own, not own those, but you probably don't own anything else in the store. You probably don't even own the clothes on your back. Your mama probably gave them to you. But I didn't say that. I should have thought it. And then, then I thought, but didn't say. But you know what? You probably could, if you quit getting caught up over who owns the plastic lids, you could become a great manager and maybe even own your own franchise one day. But... It's doubtful as long as you're caught up with the absurd notion that those plastic lids are yours and you're more worried about that than you are the customers. And then I uh, uh, reflected on the eternal symbolism of this thing that uh, rolled out before me. And I thought, you know what? We're all in an eternal McDonald's situation and the, the franchise owner, God, has entrusted to us certain stewardships and plastic lids in our lives, whether it be a car or a, 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 some children or uh, bows and ribbons in our hair or whatever it might be. And sometimes it's easy to get caught up on whose bows and ribbons are prettier than the other ones or who drives the fanciest car or who's got the biggest house. One of the great prophets in the Book of Mormon said to a proud generation, and I'm sure in a lot more beautiful words than I can paraphrase it in, but basically said, Quit worrying about all this stuff. You're only made out of dirt, and you don't even own that. You don't even own the dirt that you're made of. It reminds me of a, you're so low that, jokes, you know, you're so low that, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was the ultimate one from that. You're so low, you don't even own the dirt you're made of. But, you know, it made me think that as long as we're caught up with the absurd notion of ownership on this earth and we refuse to humble ourselves, point number one, we'll never progress. And one of our main purposes here in life is to progress. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 15, or 16 and 17, uh, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Heirs of what? What is an heir? Receivership. What does God have? Everything. Maybe one day, if we realize that we own nothing now, we may become a great manager or even franchise owner and receive our reward in the next life. I hope that we can do this someday. What a great, fabulous message to declare to the people of Peru of their potential. What a potential that we have 
that most people don't even realize that one day that that can happen. And I hope that not only can Michael declare this, that he can also fortify himself and continue to progress in the very plan that he's declaring in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Why we do service, a lot of reasons why we do the right thing. 
but then he challenged us to evaluate those reasons for which we serve. He suggested that uh, the first reason that we serve is out of duty. And that it is a noble reason to serve. We feel it's a duty to, to go out and do the thing that we said we would do. To fulfill our priesthood responsibilities. Another reason that we serve is that uh, we don't want to be punished. There are a lot of scriptures that talk about those who disobey the Lord's commandments will be punished. If you don't pay your tithing, you'll be burnt at his coming, and so forth. So to avoid the punishment of the Lord. Another reason why we serve, and again, it goes up in hierarchy and in the, in the, in the reasons, and in the, in the, in, I guess the, uh, um, the nobility or the, uh, the value for which we serve is for the reward that Heavenly Father has promised us. He has promised great things for those who keep his commandments. One of his commandments to each one of the young men is to go and serve a mission. But then Elder Oates suggested that the greatest reason for which we can serve is out of love. And I was sitting there in the mission home or in the uh, MTC listening to those words and I thought, you know, I don't even know these people that I'm going to be serving. I don't, I don't even speak their language. I don't even understand their culture. I don't even know if I can communicate with these people. And that's supposed to be the reason for which I'm serving them. Uh, and then I went back to my, uh, my dormitory and I looked up, you know, I was writing my journal before I went to bed that night and I looked and I saw all the pictures of all my family and all the people that were supporting me and I thought, you know, those are the reasons, one of, at least a lot of the reasons why I'm serving. Um, I don't know about charity. i got to work on that part. So I was reading the Book of Mormon, and of course, we, most of us have heard Moroni's admonition. So all of us. One verse in Moroni, chapter 8, verse 46. Verse 48. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed upon all of us who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when ye shall appear, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified, even as he is pure. So how do we develop this charity, this most noble reason for serving? The reason which offers the greatest rewards. Well, uh, Nancy has uh, coined the phrase in that home, love is a verb. How do you develop that love? How do you love someone? Well, like how do you run a mile? You run it. How do you love? Well, you love. You, you, you do the things that people that love other people do. And so how can Michael or any of us have that charity towards others. You love them. And uh, you can talk about it all day, but you have to get out there and serve them. Uh, to the extent that I was able to do that, I really felt that greatest peace that Moroni was talking about. Um, I want to challenge Michael to, uh, to pray with all the energy of his heart to the Father that he may be endowed with that love. For it is a gift. The gift of faith, the gift of hope, and the gift of charity are gifts of Christ. We can try to manufacture that love on our own, but ultimately it comes from God. And uh, I leave this message and silence with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
I'm sorry, I didn't have you come up, Nancy. Okay. Michael, come, let us go and perform our labors. A similar command was uttered by Jehovah to Michael the Archangel six times, and with each, Michael responded, we will go. Some period of time later, Michael the Archangel's name was changed to Adam and Jehovah's to Jesus Christ. And Adam and his wife Eve were in the Garden of were had been removed from the Garden of Eden only shortly before. And he, God, gave unto them, Adam and Eve, commandments, that they should worship the Lord their God and should offer the firstlings of their flock for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam, whose name had been Michael, was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. And after many days, and this is the key scripture, and after many days, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Michael, or Adam, saying, Why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Michael, one of Adam, said unto him, I know not, Say the Lord commanded me. And so, Michael Packard, I ask you to please remember that. Why are you... You'll say this in your own mind, Michael. Why am I doing this? Why has the mission president instructed us thus and so? And the answer is, unequivocally, because he commanded me. I, I, will, I will obey this commandment, this instruction, because he has commanded me. Unconditional obedience. That is, without strings attached, without thought of remuneration, even without understanding why, I will keep the commandment. Some may call it blind obedience, total obedience. And Michael Packard, you'll be saved if you honor the Lord's instruction and the mission president's instruction in that manner. Michael has been given a good name. He was deliberately named after Michael the Archangel and after Joseph who was sold into Egypt for various reasons. And you have an honorable name, Michael. And there are many people here this day, certainly many nephews and nieces, who, for the next two years, will be watching your obedience. And I pray that you will hold up with whatever obstacles come against you, whether there's changes in the world economy or political scene or otherwise in Peru, that you be still faithful and return honorably. You are the ninth child sent by your mother and by Nancy and my me from our home as a missionary. You are my youngest son and of the 117 grandchildren of my father and mother that is your grandparents, you are their last grandson. And so I hope you wrap that part of it up faithfully, Michael. Because there are many great grandsons and granddaughters watching and little following in the footsteps. I suppose some dear loved ones who have predeceased this are participating in this happiness service this day. And I further suppose that some of our dear loved ones will participate with you, Michael, in your mission, especially as you run up against serious obstacles. 
I love you and I trust you and I, you have a bright mind and a very pleasing personality and spirit. And I trust that you will be a great blessing to our Heavenly Father in Peru. And then later on throughout your life. I'm very thankful for your older brothers and sisters who helped pave the way for you. And I love them all. And I love all of you folks who say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thou wilt 
I would have to have a great love for the world also to go. I mean, I don't think he did it just out of obedience to his father. I think he truly had a love for us to come down and to do exactly what he did. He knew what it was before him. God loved the world for his son and his son. But that son also does. Um, one of my favorite scriptures, I've got it memorized, but uh, yeah, it's like it's the story of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is one of Jesus' good buddies. Uh, Mary and Martha and Jesus, they were uh, friends, and Lazarus was uh, a brother. I don't know if you can't remember. But um, anyway, he ends up dying, and, uh, or he was real sick. And uh, Mary and Martha, they call him Jesus, and uh, they say, hey, our friend and your friend is very really sick, and I know um, that you could help him out, and you could, uh, you could heal him. Why don't you, you know, stop by and uh, see what you can do? And Jesus didn't reply. He, uh, he kept on finishing what he was doing, and, and Lazarus does die. And um, he comes several days later. And uh, I think more importantly, he teach a lesson about um, you know faith and everything. He, he didn't get resurrecting uh, Lazarus, or raising the dead. And, um, but before that, it's, it's, it's a scripture that I've always quoted, it's, it's John 11, 35, and it says, Jesus wept. And uh, I think it's the shortest one there is. But it's important to me because um, Jesus wept, knowing what was going to happen uh, in the short future there, and uh, he was sad because Mary and Martha were sad. And they were crying, and Lazarus was dead. And he was his friend, and the whole atmosphere was dead. He knew he was pushing to come back to life, he was, you know, not too long from that. And, uh, but he was sad to him, and he showed his love. And the next verse it says, you know, oh, how he loved them. And Jesus wept out of love. He knew what was going to go on next. Now, Jesus also demonstrated love uh, when he was on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, that'd be pretty hard for me to do. And it's not just out of um, you know, obedience, I think. He also had love there. Um, and so if you look at that as uh, you know, forgiveness, and you kind of correlate that with love, and forgive those who love, you love, and forgive, it's kind of not the same, but it's sure. It's pretty close. In Matthew um, chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men as trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, we just kind of decided uh, that forgiveness works hand in hand with love. So if you love men, your heavenly Father will also love you. But, if you forgive not men as trespasses, you don't love, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And that goes into a little bit with uh, my brother David was speaking on uh, the, the fear that he's there for obeying what God says. Uh, so he commands us, it goes back earlier, he commands us all to love. Um, and Jesus demonstrated that you know, right shortly before he passed on. So, we all started to learn love. And, uh, you know, President Rock there, he, he, uh, he still it into me. I don't know if I listened to him as much as I should have, but, um, he said, said, do this man, You know, he always asked me, will you go and do this? And then, yeah, then, um, that's exactly right. That's how you learn to love. You serve, you get down the senses, and you work with these people until you develop a, a deep compassion and a love for these people. And that's what I plan on doing in Peru. Um, now, on the, the line of uh, obedience to the law, in Matthew chapter 28, I marked some of these pictures, I marked all of them, I'm kind of practice. Okay, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing uh, them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Um, that demonstrates love, like I would like to, uh, didn't say enough, a week or so. Um, I thought I'm doing that. Oh, kind of not history, I'm sorry, but basically. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going into the, um, the jungle, more or less. I love those guys, I got some missing boundaries and uh, there's a big chunk of Peru where the Amazon River is, and that's uh, my big park there. It's real big, and a city there is uh, nearly half a million in size. And the only thing you get to there is a uh, boat into the air. There's no roads, they all think. Uh, so it's, it's going to be kind of interesting down there, and I'll have uh, a chance to uh, maybe not uh, feed his feet, but maybe feed his llamas, because they have those down there too. They don't work with feet. They're doing llamas. 
I'm really excited for you to go down there. Uh, missionary force is pretty strong. Uh, the people there are receptive. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I know I'm going to love the people down there. And I hope we all can learn to love. And I'd like to bear my testimony that uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to go and serve my Lord. And I know that Jesus Christ is the yes. Uh, he's shown in my faith. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ. I love him with all my heart. And I'm so grateful for the things he's done for me. I know this church is true. I have a testimony of the gospel. I have a testimony of the scripture. I believe that. I'm grateful for the love that I have for my family, for my friends, the people here. I'm grateful for the support that God's given me. I'm glad to have followed my family's sister. I'm the last of, I don't know if Ben knew it, but uh, both sides of my grandparents. I think I'm the last one there. And um, I'm appreciative of that. You got uh, three shoes to fill. I thank you all for, for being my friends and supporting me. I love you all. I love my baby. Name is Jesus Christ.
Father in heaven. We bow our heads, close to this uh, prayer of God. We do that we have to pay it. We go to the will that we have to in which we have to take an understanding in the movement. We submit our humble prayer at this moment. First of all, we appreciate and thank you for it. Well, as we saw in the hosting, composition of the words is such a beautiful thing, such a meaningful, such a special thing. Drew from heaven to compose such words. Preaching thoughts and complaining may give us the splendid of the Savior in all of his knowledge. In the end of which, Michael is going forth to his public little girl. And that's his eldest Savior, the way this is the evening of the call of the Savior. I appreciate the fact that he's willing to serve and he's going forth to serve, not only to serve, but to serve his love, which is the highest law. All these other commandments are schools of the great law of love. Appreciate this thought as the only God of Savior for the things I can tell you. On all of the laws, we appreciate this. We appreciate my coming here. We We support him, all of us. We put the good spirit that we sought on this meeting. From the beginning, we feel as though we have that same thing. But there are unseen yet, perhaps, in this meeting. We have been. People such as my dear mother, Michael's mother, and the chef, and the teacher, and others. That I think is beautiful. And I pray, unbeknownst to us in a sense, but in another way, so I appreciate this. And our divine administration will appreciate all the things that come from the beautiful gospel. We embrace collectively and in individually we support my soul. Send your force and humility and mission. All our thanks to close of this meeting in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.